I'm Lewis Blackwell. I'm the um, Director of Strategy and Development here at the Building Centre. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the last in the series of talks that we're doing with the Super Material Exhibition. I'm just turning my phone off. I think it's a good idea. We all do that, didn't you? There we go. Just turn it to silent. Lovely. Um, but actually, you can just turn it to silent because you want to hashtag and all that kind of stuff and send things out. There's some details there. So this is the session we will come to. And it's kind of quite a good, uh, quite a good point to end things with, I think, uh, as, as a discussion of super material, looking at what's that cycle of taking things from innovative materials through innovative products to innovative buildings, and then we'll be feeding back the needs and the challenges and, and refining and defining further. Um, so that's what we're sort of looking at in a way tonight. Um, before I kick into that, I should just remind you a couple of housekeeping things. You know the way out, uh, if need be, if in a rush back up the stairs you came, or out that way. Uh, we're videoing it, as we often do with these events nowadays, so if you want to straighten the tie or whatever you want to do, but uh, anyway, just warning, basically, we're here, it's being videoed. The videos tend to go up about a week later, if you ever want to sort of catch up on things and see what we've been doing, uh, that's, that's when they're there. And indeed, many of the, other, the previous presentations in the series uh, are on, online already, I think. So, Get my glasses out, it's going to be my notes a bit better. Yeah. Um, this process of, of getting innovative products, getting innovative materials through into the building situation, it's, it's quite an unusual one, I think, in construction. Construction is often seen as one of the most conservative worlds. After all, you know, we're still using a lot of bricks, and bricks go back a long way. But there's innovation in brick too, I'm sure. We're not going to look at that tonight. But we do have a certain weight of, 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 of pressures that keep things maybe quite conservative in the building process. And that's, that's for good reasons. I mean, obviously, one doesn't want to be pro living in a prototype uh, and things falling down around your ears. It has to be really, really safe. Uh, and it has to fit people's sort of uh, expectations of their environment, what they feel comfortable in. I mean, it's not, you might have a jazzy watch that can be innovative. You might have your new Apple iWatch or whatever, but it's a bit different with your buildings. So um, there's reasons why buildings are deeply conservative and all sorts of planning reasons that go on and the fact they have to fit in the middle of everything else. That's a lot of pressure that sort of stands in the way of innovation. Um, and one can go on. I think some of our speakers might touch on those sort of pressures that, that hold back the innovative development of new products uh, and delivering to innovative buildings. But what, of course, we're emphasizing is how do we get that innovation coming through? What, what does it take to maybe speed that up a bit tonight? Um, so our balanced, uh, balanced panel we have here, we have four speakers. Two of them are coming from the manufacturer side, different products. Uh, and they'll be telling us from a sort of somewhat different experiences um, uh, and different aspects of what it means to sort of be innovating through the manufacturer process. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, a specifier who's worked one of those products. So that's, that's going to be a pretty good example of how, how does that product end up being in a building and why is that product in a building. Uh, and then right on the sort of the, the, the cutting edge of things, we've had somebody come all the way from Wisconsin, from a university there, um, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, who's done one of the materials upstairs, one of a really interesting um, uh, uh, a display upstairs using cellulose, charged cellulose to generate power that could be generating power from the buildings we walk around in and things. And so that's a cutting edge idea coming through into a product and maybe a few steps away, as it were, from being in Tottenham Court Road Station. Uh, and clearly, the, 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 this is the technology that we do know is starting to come through, needs to be coming through. I mean, it's an incredible, wonderful, sustainable idea there. But how does that come to market? So perhaps we can sort of factor some of the learning from the manufacturers back into thinking, how can that really innovative product uh, um, take off. So the first speaker, uh, the first speaker, let me have a look at my sheet here, um, is Hamish Watson. Uh, not, not quite the order you see on the slide. I think the logic of the slide is maybe possibly alphabetical, but anyway, the, the logic of the speaker is it's going to be Hamish Watson, who's the founder and the CEO of Polysolar. Uh, Polysolar is also one of the uh, things in the exhibition. Uh, and uh, it's a leading manufacturer, developer of, of integrated glazing. Um, prior to setting up Polysolar, Hamish was involved in technology commercialization and business consulting, and indeed established the first foreign registered market research company in China. Uh, I don't think he's talking about that tonight, but he's going to be talking about Polysolar 
and a very interesting uh, process of how did it bring its product to market, how does that kind of come into our lives, and, and perhaps where can that go next. So Hamish, uh, over to you. Automatically on. Um, good evening. Um, as I've been introduced, I'm uh, Hamish Watson. I'm the founder of PolySolar. Um, PolySolar is a what is known as building integrated photovoltaics a company. We design and manufacture and install uh, photovoltaics in buildings. What makes us unique is the development of uh, transparent photovoltaics. So that's as a replacement for window glass at the end of the day. Um, what I'll try and do is give you an introduction to what we do as a company, um, but then more importantly, how we manage to get into the market, because um, as has been expressed, um, the building industry is notoriously conservative and difficult in which to launch new products in many respects. Um, and that goes across the board from our experience, um, both from the sort of the architectural specifying end right through to the actual construction end. And it's really related to who's taking the risk and who's getting the reward. And in many cases, new products are not giving the reward to the people involved in the supply chain. Um, they're only giving the reward to the end customer. And that's not good enough. You've got to actually give rewards further down the supply chain in order to everybody get everybody working together on it. Um, we, I, I don't come from a building background, um, so my learning in this has been the experience of having developed product for market for an opportunity that we saw um, and learning about the building trade on route and that's quite a hard learning curve I can tell you. <laughs> um, so I'll just, uh, sorry I should put this on, on first. So, so um, obviously today we're talking about from labs to prefabs. Um, as a company that's what we've done. Um, we've gone labs to what we call fabs, which is the fabrication side of it, to the prefabs. So it's uh, uh, a third element in there, but, um, but generally the, the same thing. Um, and uh, what I'll also do towards the end, if we've got enough time, I'll just run through some case studies of, of, product, of, of you know, buildings that we've put our, our product into um, to date, our current products. So what are building integrated photovoltaics? Why would you uh, use building integrated photovoltaics? Um, it is the building material, first and foremost. It is a power generator, second. Um, the great advantage of it is that it is a marginal additional cost on a building. So if you think of putting PV on a roof of a building or on a field, it's, it's a full cost in itself. Converting one piece of cladding to another piece of cladding, you're only taking the PV element of that cost on there. In buildings and in the urban environment, you're obviously taking up less space by being able to utilize other areas of the building that you wouldn't otherwise use. Um, and thirdly, by using it in buildings, you're using the power straight off. Um, so that means that you haven't got any grid infrastructure issues and those sorts of things as well. So there's quite a lot of reasons why building integrated photovoltaics is seen as the, the future for power generation more generally. Um, and as we're sort of seeing more generally in the grid um, and the UK's energy supply mix and everything else, it's, it's, it's no longer sort of oh, the future, it is already the current. What we're trying to do is move that into the built environment much more than it currently is. Um, and, and that's where we're heading. So um, in terms of understanding why you'd use building integrated photovoltaics or, or, or solar glass, um, it is a multifunctional product. It's not just a power generator. It has the sort of standard elements of why you use glass as a weather, weatherproof material, um, but it also allows you for further sort of design elements in there. Um, but probably more importantly, um, for our point of view and from, from the industry's point of view, um, is actually the thermal control side of it. So one of the big issues on building buildings, commercial buildings today, is you want as much glass as possible to let natural light in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you do that, your thermal gain is too great, um, and therefore you've got problems, or thermal losses are too great, and you've got problems. Um, solar PV glass deals with a lot of the, the, the thermal gain and, and thermal loss issues. Um, so as a double-glazed unit, our, our, G, oh sorry, our U values are below 1, our G values are sort of 0.2. So, so you're already achieving a lot of what you would do with very expensive glass currently. Um, so regardless of the power generation, there's reason for, for building integrated photovoltaics. 
Um, probably more important, though, is the cost. Um, now, the attractiveness of a, a building integrated photovoltaics or photovoltaics more generally is that you're getting a return on investment. Um, that is irrelevant from the construction element. You are dealing in cost per square meter, um, and that's what's key. Um, yes, if you are uh, owner-occupied developer, you might be able to take into account the returns on investment in terms of the actual power generation that you're getting. But as a, develop as a, as a builder or the construction side of it, that actually is not that important uh, at the end of the day. It's cost per square meter and meeting all your, your building regulations. With building integrated photovoltaics, you've got the um, standard um, construction costs. You've got your standard curtain walling costs. Yes, the glass is slightly more expensive in most cases, but if you're replacing a marble wall with a glass wall, it'll be cheaper. So it's not entirely that the case. And then you've got electrical costs on top of that, which is usually less than around about a quarter of the total cost of a PV project is, is, the, is the actual electrical element of it, just so you a better idea. And that can be offset by things like getting rid of brie soleils. You don't need a brie soleil if you've already got your, your, your thermal gain significantly reduced and you've got your shading in there. Um, so it's an attractive financial play even in days when feed-in tariff subsidies are no longer quite as attractive as they used to be. And in fact, feed-in tariff it was a complete disaster for building integrated photovoltaics because it meant that people saw solar as an investment proposition rather than a considered um, building material proposition. Um, in terms of our products, we uh, work on thin film uh, photovoltaics primarily, but we also do uh, crystalline silicon. So you've seen the panels where you've sort of got glass, um, solar cells interspersed within glass. Um, but the advantage of the thin film is that it's designed specifically for building integrated. So it works in lower light levels, um, and that means you can put it on the verticals, you can put it on the east, west, and even north faces of the buildings, and you're still getting a, 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 an energy return. Um, equally, you've got um, temperature issues with solar. So most solar panels, even in the UK, sitting on a roof will get too hot in the summer. You're actually not producing as much power as you should be producing by any stretch. Um, it means you can put them into insulated units, you can directly insulate against um, that without that impacting your power generation. Um, and the other sort of key element is the shading. Um, shading is a big issue when you're putting it on facades of buildings, you've very seldomly got a consistent um, area of light on a building. Um, thin film panels are based on high voltage, you link in parallel rather than long series strings and that's how you, that you largely avoid a lot of the shading issues. Um, and then there's a few other things there as well. Another big sort of driver for it is, is the, the area of, um, uh, uh, of planning, building controls, local carbon taxes, etc. BRIAM in particular is driving a lot of the demand for it um, because you're getting additional BRIAM points beyond the energy <coughs> generation. You're getting points for innovation, you're getting points for light, etc., etc., natural light and those sorts of elements. So you can build up very easily your BRIAM excellence without the huge investment that usually is the case there. So we produce, just to give you a bit of our history, um, we, started, uh, we've, we started life as a company uh, um, nearly 10 years ago now. Um, we are one of the leading players as a BIPV company in the world, in spite of the fact that we're basically a micro company. Um, our first generation product is based on amorphous silicon, which I won't go into the details of, but it's been around for a long time. It was developed originally by BP. Um, our current generation of products is based on a technology called cadmium telluride, um, and it's unique as a transparent window uh, or glazing unit, um, and it's colorless. It's letting natural light through. Um, and that's what we're, we're currently sort of selling to Maho. We're doing both currently. And we're also developing what is known as uh, next generation photovoltaics based on organic polymers. So that's plastic electronics. So the, the where you'll be familiar with that is, is in things like display screens, current, some mo modern display screens which are based on plastic electronics um, or light, polymer light emitting diodes basically. And this is the reverse of a polymer light emitting diode, it's a polymer absorbing of diode. Um, we work in collaboration on that um, with a number of different companies, but we are probably the leading player in that field. 
lump, the, the great beauty of, of organic photovoltaics is that it's a liquid print process, so we print directly onto the glass, and that means that we can supply process lines to the manufacturers, the glass processors, as just another process coating. Um, and that means that you can then have bespoke sizes, units, um, all those sorts of things. So we fit into an existing supply chain rather than trying to sort of add on to a supply chain, which is much harder as a business um, in, this, in this field. Um, so how have we got to where we've got to? Um, our key sort of point has been collaboration. Um, as a company, as a startup company, a technology company, as a background, you know, how do you get into to an industry like the, the building materials industry? Um, and we've done it through collaboration. We've done it collaboration throughout, and that's allowed us to punch beyond our wheat and also save us vast sums of money. So as a company, we have, uh, we're internally funded, so we've never sought external investment. Um, and we're rare in that respect, but that's also why we've survived. There are very few solar companies who've been around for 10 years, I can tell you. <laughs> um, so on the R&D side, um, more straightforwardly, we work with universities, we work with um, research institutes and that sort of thing. On product development, we work with companies who have an interest in this field. So we've been, we developed um, specialist connectors which allow us to put the wiring within standard curtain walling frames, for example. Um, we've contracted out all our manufacturing, so we, we actually get others to manufacture to our design rather than invest in the manufacturing plants ourselves. Um, we work with other distributors to distribute our product as well as ourselves and we work externally with installation. So it's, it's all outsourced, um, and that's allowed us as a very small company to, to, to actually get into the big projects, both in the UK and internationally. The other side of it is, is leveraging the, 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 the value chain itself in terms of money. Um, we, uh, we use grants, and I recommend grants or applying to grants um, to as many people. That's basically administered under Innovate UK, which basically control all the, the research and development grants in the UK. Um, we're, on a, we're in an area which is, is quite sexy, i.e. it's energy supply. Um, that's, that's quite an important sector to the UK more generally. Um, it's not always so attractive in other areas, so I, I warn you, um, if, you're, if you're after that, you know, which, which bits are more attractive than others, but anyway. Um, the other thing we've used quite a lot of is awards. Um, awards both financially, so people like Shell, Springboard, I don't know if anybody's heard of that. Um, but it's not just the cash element of that, it's, it's actually the sort of assistance and the management and the support that you get around that um, to allow you to a enter a lot of other people. So we've had access through awards through to to the heads of, uh, of the architectural, the major architectural firms, the heads of the major construction design firms, et cetera, et cetera, which we wouldn't have otherwise necessarily had um, to be able to sort of sway the chairman of Arab and those sorts of things. Um, also, it's a matter of using partners' budgets. Um, so rather than using your own money, try and use other people's uh, money <laughs> to, to, to develop those products and to get where you want to be. So whether that's at exhibitions or, 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 or whether, uh, or whether it's, 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 it's developing small elements of what you're trying to do. Um, and also the other sort of key thing is, is the client side of it. Um, clients allow you to educate you um, to understand what the key drivers are. It's not always straightforward, um, but they ultimately will allow you to learn and hopefully from your, your learning you, you'll be able to supply a better product um, better suited to what they with what they do. Um, it's not actually all same plain sailing though. The, the the trouble with partnering is that you have less control. Um, you're reliant on how others work, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, for example, we've worked with both Cambridge University and Imperial, um, both of which set up rival companies to us. Um, so, you know, you have to understand it's not entirely straightforward. Um, it's also quite hard work um, to manage that relationships and all those multiple relationships that we have. So we, you know, we have thousands of different relationships that we've got to manage, and that's a time-consuming thing. Um, but at the end of the day, unless you do collaborate, you just won't make it, I think is, is true to say. And I think most people would agree you can't sort of do it without that collaboration um, and working with others. Um, how am I doing time-wise? 
Good. <laughs> um, I'll run through some case studies which sort of give you a better idea of some of the stuff we do um, and, and have done. Um, Sainsbury's, we work with Sainsbury's on um, petrol station canopies. Um, so this one's in, in Leicester. Um, unfortunately, the supermarkets aren't really building new stores at the moment, so it's not, <laughs> not doing um, particularly well on that front. But um, uh, this is a, an example. This is, runs a, this is about a third of the power requirement of the petrol station, which covers the pumps, the kiosk, the chillers in the kiosk, um, even the car wash. And so a third of its power requirements isn't bad from that. The other beauty of this particular design is that it, because it's not a dual um, level um, uh, petrol station canopy, it's actually got significantly set less steel in it. So the actual structure itself was cheaper to produce than it would have been for a conventional petrol station canopy. Um, this is a, uh, a building at BRE in Watford. I don't know if anybody's been there and seen this one. It, it was put up in the 1990s. It was actually on a BBC Carol Vorderman um, build program. Um, it has a three-story conservatory. They used to boil alive inside. Um, we replaced that, so this is a retrofit with our glazing. Um, it produces all its power, so it's a zero-carbon building, pretty excellent building. Um, this is a bus stop in Canary Wharf. Um, we're working with Canary Wharf on some of their new towers to put our, our product in. This is more of a sort of uh, trial um, site for them in, in the sense of that. But this, this is a bus stop. This is a, around about a three kilowatt. So that's equivalent of a London apartment's total energy requirements over a year in terms of that, what this is generating. Um, and that's fed into the shopping center below primarily the power on that. Um, the only problem with this one is that what we failed to really take into account was the fact that it has a bus um, stopping in front of it every half, half a minute, um, <laughs> which rather shades it, so it's <laughs> not ideal. Um, but this is using our sort of 20% transparent glass. We, we do it in, in up to 50%. Um, but as you can see, that's still letting quite a lot of light through um, as a 20% as a um, transparent. Um, this is a building in Cambridge. It's actually a fairly small uh, array on, on the stairwell um, interspersed uh, as a sort of design uh, thing. But interestingly with this, we've also got 40 kilowatts of conventional solar on the roof. Um, and in December, the facade, which faces south, produces more power than the roof. Um, so that's an indication of, you know, unless it's optimally placed with conventional solar panels, it doesn't really work. You need to. Um, with, with, with thin film, it, it'll work in much less optimal environments. Um, and this one also keeps, keeps the, the temperature down within the stairwell. Um, this is a, a hotel up in Donington Park where the race course is. Um, it's, it's not a particularly large um, array, but it, it's uh, a replacement on a sort of roofing area, um, uh, service area. Um, let sufficient light through, um, but also looks attractive at the same time. Um, and this is just something we've just um, completed, actually, uh, which is Hathersage in the uh, Peak District. I don't know if anybody's ever swum in this Lido. Um, but um, sort of built in the 1920s, um, and it was a restoration job, so it restored what was um, a corrugated iron roof on, on the, the sort of seating area um, with our solar glass. So this, this is uh, helping to, to power their electricity needs of that, that uh, arrangement, but at a cost which, quite frankly, was not really any different from replacing the roof with conventional glazing. So that sort of um, comes to a sort of conclusion of my talk in, in terms of it. And I think well, you know, what I'm sort of just trying to impart is that you know, the, the, the future for BIPV is quite interesting, uh, quite exciting. It's taken a long time to get anywhere, um, but has now got product um, and supply chain to actually um, deliver it. So uh, um, thanks very much. Thank you. We'll take, uh, I didn't actually say at the start, we'll take questions at the end. Um, so just kind of get up those questions. That way we can sort of cross-refer and things if, between the speakers easier. Um, our next speaker uh, is Ernst de Horst, and he was a project lead of the Home Arts Centre uh, by Mechanu Architects. Ernst is currently with uh, Field and Clegg Bradley, 
He was involved in setting up McAnew's office. Uh, um, uh, he had the Manchester office, that is, and um, he was responsible for the design and delivery of a key regeneration project, uh, the mixed-use culture home at First Street, which he's going to talk about, and that will lead into talking about the use of a particular product. So I think probably best to, to hand over to Ernst. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> good evening, everyone. Um, it's good to be here, and I'm looking forward to telling you about this, uh, this project. Um, interesting, the word collaboration was used. I think that's really the, the key, really, to, to work collaboratively with partners, in this case with Tremo. Uh, many of you are here today, and uh, really, really happy to have seen that the product in the end was, was, a, was a, a wonderful product through a bit of luck, uh, a lot of hard work, and a lot of innovation, really work, get, you know, getting your hands dirty and really um, making it work, which we did. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I'm going to tell you a bit about the journey that we went through to create this building. I was um, working in a, a, an office at Simpson Hoff where I worked for Tim, 10 years uh, in 2011 and it, things were still quiet after the re sort of the recession period and big news in Manchester, it's, it's not a big place, but uh, it, was, it was that Mechanu had won this project for this incredible uh, new building in um, what was just an empty wasteland near the centre of the city. Um, <clears throat> and it was for the, um, maybe I'll stand over here, but it was um, for a new home for the Corner House, an art gallery, cinema, restaurant and bar doing very, very well on Oxford Road, right in the, the heart of the city. And <clears throat> the Library, th library Theatre Company, which uh, was a small 500-seat theatre uh, underneath the Central Library, the Central Library being refurbished and they no longer having a home. Um, <clears throat> so the, the city, uh, as they often are, practically thought that them no, no longer having a home in the corner house being quite restrained in an old building themselves that uh, and this site laying empty it was uh, the site that was going to be the BBC site that Salford ended up getting win, going on to win uh, the city thought well what I know uh, well, we know Let, let's go and create something new uh, a hybrid of theatre arts in terms of cinema art galleries and uh, excellent food and drink offer, offer in one place and here's the site sort of uh, before it was built. So next, right next to the railway line, which is a great place to build an acoustically sensitive uh, building, um, with freight line um, sailing through there, um, you know, quite a few times a day and regular train services. Um, so, yes, yeah, so uh, get back to my story. So I uh, jump around a little bit, but um, <clears throat> I, I, uh, I'm actually Dutch. I'm a sort of Dutch Mancunian and Mechanic, obviously Dutch. And I, I sort of dropped them a line and said, look, um, if you're looking for someone to be involved in this project, you probably haven't got anyone better to, to do it. Of course, I'd say that. Um, <clears throat> um, but actually, they were desperate for somebody, as it happened, to, 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 because the city council really wanted that local presence. So, sort of cut long sh story short, I ended up joining Mechanu and leading the project for the next three years. Um, and yeah, these are some. So, I joined just when the sort of the, the, the initial competition started and won. Um, and these are some of the ideas that came up with, and that was really, what if um, the corner house and the library theatre meet at First Street and Whitworth Street? So not super central. It feels much more central now, actually. But, um, and it's funny how you forget how, how distant this place felt, but key constraint was it's not right in the heart. You can see the Bridgewater Hall there, which is another regeneration project through arts, through culture that the city uh, keep doing, uh, and that's been successful too. Um, yeah. How does it become a catalyst in its own right? How do you make these this viaduct, which is a big barrier, but cities on that side and this is on this side, it feels like a world away. How do you actually put draw people through and, and, and make a place here that people want to be and enjoy being in, and, and that businesses Im importantly want to be around? I mean, that's the key thing that Manchester really wants to do is create job opportunities, and, and through culture that creates place, and the people want to be there. That's the sort of circle that they they, they t try to think of. And the, uh, the urban space is fundamental. We, we, didn't, we weren't involved in the actual design, uh, but we did collaborate with designers on, on the public square that we created in the middle of this new district. Um, and you know, how could that be drawn into the space? Um, I'll come on to the, the, the building exterior at the end, but you know, it's a fascinating mix of uses there and sort of the spec color spectrum you can see there, you know, how that might uh, fit itself into the building. 
how might you connect users with the, both the environment and what's going on inside in a really open way. Didn't, they didn't want this to be a pretentious place as m some arts places and cult uh, buildings are. They want it to be very open, very engaging. And one of the first jobs I had was really to, to explore this emerging master plan where the city really wanted to keep their, their options open because the, the, you know, the times weren't brilliant uh, and then they really were tr looking for the right people to come forward with investment, so in terms of hotels and, and, and office uh, and, and retail opportunities. So we, we developed various schemes with the council, with the, the master planners and, 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 and uh, other designers and engineers and then ended up drawing the, the scheme into the heart of the first street district. <coughs> Um, and this is a sort of a critical sort of section where we're showing this, sort of the city on this side and the new district on this, so how we try to try and draw that in. And, and this building's almost invisible, but that's sort of stacking those different volumes on top of each other to express them and, and draw people in. Um, and in this world, in this theatre world, in this arts world, it, what's really important is that you know, the, the front of house, which many of you will see day to day, is just as well designed and well thought out of as the back of house. And that involves arranging a jigsaw of multi multiple pieces of, 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 uh, and shapes uh, into a building in a really efficient way, much like a car, uh, and its parts, and, and doing that really well. Um, we ended up with a sort of, in plan, a building that sandwiched itself, um, uh, addressed this new public square to the south, um, sort of um, address the, the, the constraint of the railway viaduct to the north. Uh, there's actually a, a river culvert under here, so that, that sort of started to generate constraint for the site to that angle. And there was further sort of hotel to the left and retail facilities on the right and an office to the south. And that helped him create this new square. Um, and within this, you can see there's a main theater of 500 seats in red, an art gallery on the right, uh, and new bar facilities sort of spiraling up uh, through the building and studio theatre on the, on the first floor and then on the second floor, five cinema cluster uh, where various cinemas could, could swap between a 250 seat theatre right down to a sort of 20 seat intimate um, theatre with, with large lounge seats. Um, and, and on the south you've got a, a, a terrace and event space. Um, which sort of manifested itself in this way with the theatre, uh, diagrammatically speaking, uh, addressing, um, sitting in the heart of the building and public functions facing the square. So in summary, that sort of um, sequence of, of design processes sort of in 3D assembled like this. These are all the acoustic auditoria. And we, what was really important, what the city wanted was quite a, with, with all these mixes of uses, to have a very clear identity for the building. You've got diff two different organizations, six, seven, eight different uses in the buildings and lots of different forms. They, they wanted really quite a, a strong identity, not, not a, a fragmented, disparate identity. And, and within that, I, I came an idea to wrap the building in this curved form, that's a slight reference to the corner house, which had a curved corner, and, and wrap it in this sort of vertical lattice, which allowed light in, allowed, allowed people to see in and people to see out um, to the building. Um, and we explored that in various ways early on, um, nighttime, daytime being really important, uh, these sort of sketch um, diagrams. And uh, this prow as well was sort of a land grab actually to try and allow the building to express itself uh, and the entrance in a strong way whilst meeting the accommodation with, uh, brief which needed to, to, to be larger in, in a larger footprint. Um, so. Let's see, yes. Um, so we came up with a, with a the city was really happy. The, the, the building inside was working functionally really well. Um, all the cogs were, were sort of working brilliantly. Um, but then, the, as often does in a project, there was a big budget problem. Uh, you know, the, 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 we'd, we'd, developed, we'd found this material, this, uh, which I haven't got with me. I want to bring a little sample with me, but this really fascinating stainless steel product. Uh, coloured stainless steel, which um, through uh, an electro electrolytic process um, is the, the upper layer of the stainless steel is controlled, the thickness of it controlled, which means that a only a certain light bounces back to, to what you see in your eyes. 
Um, and it had wonderful depth. Uh, it had r wonderful sort of a natural uh, and, 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 and varying color, a little bit like this visual. Um, this was just the CGI. So what we really enjoyed about that was that, that it was like an old pair of jeans. It kind of really had sort of character and, and, and panache. And it also, importantly, the council wanted it to be really durable and that water, dirt, etc., would run off easily, it, you know, it would last. So it seemed like the dream sort of product, right fit for the, for the scheme. But um, at the end of the day, the, 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 the users who were in the building, they didn't want to compromise, and they, rightly so, they shouldn't compromise on a 500-seat theatre, should be a 500-seat, it should be a 400-seat theatre. There should be five cinemas, there shouldn't be four, because that's essential to their business plan. So we were kind of in a catch-22, and everyone looked around the table, and this big, big meeting, you know, we've got a real, we've got a million pound problem on a 25 million scheme. And we were nearly there, you know, it's all, all, all uh, there to, to, to go up, but they sort of, everyone looked around, the architect said, right, well, you're going to have to do something with that, that elevation, we're going to have to go with, I don't know, cheap aluminium or something, just, you're going to have to th think of something, and we were like, oh, okay, right. And everyone really thought of the, that the, the, up, the moment to, to use that, that lovely material that we had gone, and, and that's, uh, this, is a, this is a balloon to illustrate you know, uh, we've been going through a process of trying to take area out of the building, but no matter how much you do that, you squeeze in one place, it comes out another. So we've got to a position where you couldn't save any more money, and, and it really, the facade was the last bit, bit that we could do. And coincidentally, I went to the Jodrell um, Bank Visitor Centre, which is a Tremo scheme, but all by Field and Clay Bradley, as it happens. <laughs> And they, they had this scheme, I went with, went with my kids, and it was really uh, interesting, fascinating place. But they had this very simple box, black box, and I was really interested to see what it was. It was sort of a composite panel with steel on the outside. And so I sort of, I sort of uh, picked the phone up to Ron Fitch, and we started to look at what this system was. It was a really interesting system. It was high, super good U-value, very good. Th we, we had to make sure the building was, I forgot to mention this, <laughs> um, very thermally efficient, and this product was that. It was very airtight uh, uh, and very thermally efficient, 0.17 U-value. Um, and it offered a number of advantages because it could be erected very quickly, um, and it also pulled out a number of trades out of, the, out of the, the, the supply chain because in a traditional facade, what you often do is put a wall in, and then you get somebody else to put some woolly mineral wool in there, and you put a frame on it, and then the, somebody else comes on and puts a, 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 a sort of a, a dressing on the top. But with this system, it's literally just a very simple um, clip system which clicks together and, and, and just forms a super airtight system. What these guys had done, had found a uh, patented a, 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 a system that had a very good quality to it in terms of external experience, appearance. Um, whereas a lot of these composite types of materials are just sort of often referenced to industrial sheds and whatnot. Uh, and this is some of their sort of zoom in to the, to the detail of how, how it's kind of formed, which still won't tell me how they do it, of course not. But um, it's in Slovenia, uh, fascinating uh, thing. But yeah, we then said, um, well, and, and I'm missing a slide here because obviously I'm not working at McCann anymore, but we, Ron and I, we said, well, why don't we actually use that stainless steel product? And they had, FEMA hadn't done that before on this Cubus One system. And uh, he said, all right, let me go and try it in Slovenia. So in the factory, uh, got the stainless steel, uh, just the silver stainless steel, and they managed to press it. They were worried that the stainless steel is too strong to, to really be pressed and formed in that way. But it worked. Uh, and then we said, oh, why don't we use this co the, the coloured stainless steel that we originally thought we could use, and, and where does that fit within the budget range? And it, actually, it fitted in the, the, bud the reduced budget that we all worried about. We couldn't afford anything with but paper, but actually it could really, really work. And through prototyping and testing, going back and forth, um, it, it started to really manifest itself. So this, this is sort of the end product, and I've got a few photos, but um, it... We, we had to really work hard at the detail of how it interfaced with glazing. Um, this is the, the main entrance prow that you saw earlier. And then you can sort of see some of that sheen of that stainless steel in that, that really robust system. Um, and, and really, yeah, it's, got a, it's got a great quality to it, very dark, very light, depending on the time of day. So I guess, yeah, it's... Um, it, it, inside, it's a really vibrant building. It's a it's a really in, interesting place. Really busy. Uh, the, the restaurant was designed for 120 people. It's now 
uh, about 200 covers. They managed to squeeze through various things, but it's busy all times of the day, which is great to see. <coughs> Theatre's busy. And uh, importantly, the district now is a district. It's a real success. And, and, and people are learning to love this building as they did the original ones back in the day. So, um, yeah, we're really pleased with the way that you know, the, 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 the building product has kind of helped make this possible, really, because it wasn't going to be. Uh, and that's just a testament to how, how we had to really work together uh, in a really strong, unified way and go through loads of um, hurdles along the way to make sure it's possible. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, that's it. That was really interesting, Ernst, to sort of see how, um, you know, like from, from, the, from the city trying to resolve an area of a city and taking a certain approach there, and it leads to certain solutions, and, and then you end up thinking you need to do a wall in a certain way, and they're brought into a certain vision, and then you want to deliver that vision, but actually you can't deliver that vision, and, you, and then, but actually you get to a great solution yes. with a certain product. And, and of course, that's happening all the time in many places where products are being chosen. There's sort of different pressures coming together. That's that complex and, and often conservative uh, process that happens in construction, but in this case, led to a, a, a pretty innovative solution. So we're going to go to the other side of it now, because our uh, next speaker is Liam McGrath, who worked with Ron at Tremo, that, um, that, that Ernst mentioned as, as, as part of the team there that worked on this. So Liam is going to give us an insight into sort of, so how does it work from the manufacturer side there, uh, where is Liam, there is, um, to, uh, to sort of develop that product a bit further, and actually also I think, show us a couple of other projects, because what's quite interesting is, I think that you know, for some reason, this, this uh, the Cupid system, there seems to be some very good architects using it, and uh, yeah, so why are they using it? What is it that they're locking into, and how does that sort of feed back into the cycle of, uh, of development? Thank you. How am I scrolling here? Nothing. Ah. Hello. Um, yes, um, Ernst has more or less introduced um, the Cubus product. It goes back um, to the 70s, really, when we started to... Um, oh, there we go again. Where am I going here? This way. You can see um, some other library pictures we have of the same thing. I'll just skip past that. You can see here um, in the middle on the line, we have um, gone right back to the mid 70s where we started using um, uh, making composites from um, with the use of polyurethane foam cores. In the 80s, Tremo moved forward to uh, use um, mineral wool lamellas for mainly functional reasons. It allowed us to, um, first of all, it's non-combustible. Um, it has a superior acoustic performance. It allows us to span further with a single unit. And ultimately, it gives us a superior flatness and architectural type finish. You can see here, this may be the, the on the top left is one of the early samples yeah. of the, the stainless, the plain stainless steel. Yeah and uh, Ernst uh, mentioned, and then they tried the colour. You can actually maybe, I don't know, is it quite obvious on the slide, but you can see there's a kind of a greeny tinge on one um, angle and blue from another, and that's the, that's when you get up close to the building itself, you can see that that two-tone colour variation, depending on the way the light is bouncing from it. Um, the mineral wool, um, again, that's lamellas in form that, cut to size and the thickness to offer the necessary U value gives the flatness which is which is and was necessary to allow stainless steel which Ernst mentioned is quite a, a rigid product and would wouldn't really uh, lend itself to something that undulates as such so with the combination of the mineral wool um, lamellas and <coughs> the the formed stainless steel you end up with, and again, this is just a 3D image of the cruciform joint oh. that was developed in 2009, um, and th that moved on. This is um, the this, the blanks that we use. The stainless steel um, itself needed to be quite accurate because it's all automated and robotized um, on the manufacturing line. Um, so. Before we discussed um, the, the home project with Ernst, we were 
tasked with um, this particular beauty. It's the McLaren Technology Center um, by Foster and Partners, and they saw the they saw this particular product, liked it, but said, you know, maybe if this was closed and this was flush, so they took away that particular um, design brief, re re did the tooling, etc and allowed us to arrive at this, which is now something we market as an option on the system. You can see here it's possible to form it into curves. You would have seen the curve going the opposite way on a vertical panel on the home building. This is in a horizontally oriented panel. Again, that can be curved around to suit the design requirements. And again, in the backdrop, again, you can see that the, the white was all used internally, so it can be used internally, externally, it's all a closed system, so the mineral wool and the fibers don't get into the, the air in the environment. <coughs> Pardon me. And again, another view of this building that gave rise to the interest from Ernst. This is apparently a map of the Milky Way. Uh, don't know, we were just approached and asked, can you put this using this system on your products to give us this aesthetic? And it's turns heads all over the place, public and professionals alike. Um, various other um, high, pretty famous names. We have several portions. Again, you can see that that curvature is possible. Um, various, this has a mixture of the recessed in the vertical, um, flush in the horizontal, and that, you know, it's a bit in the dark. That, there's a map of the world etched into that other area down there. There's extensive use of the Cubus products on Heathrow Airport. This is at Terminal 2 by Grimshaw Architects. And this, again, is another one of that particular So You can see how the architecture from Mekanu allowed for the, the, the glazing to come to the face and kind of share the, the same plane as the cladding panels. It's quite effective, like I say, in in the sunlight, you get the variegated appearance. In the night light, it just disappears into a darkness, offering the light through from inside. And that's more or less that. Great, thank you very much, Liam. That's funny. Um, so we've gone right through there from you know, an architectural well, a competition winning brief to, to right to the they're actually pushing forward the product and, and seeing how it kind of gets, you know, really get, innovates uh, time and again. Um, but now we're going to sort of step outside of this, this sort of uh, loop of the practical in a way and to like, well, where do the ideas come from that lead to interesting products? You know, you have to sort of understand material science and, and push the boundaries. And clearly, understanding material science fed, feeds right through into that female product there with, with the pushing what you can do with stainless steel and pushing what you can do with that closed system. But we're going to, you know, we're actually very fortunate to have Chunwa, who is our fourth speaker, um, who's come all the way from Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin University, to talk to us about uh, something that's upstairs in the exhibition, this, this cellulose panel. And, and it's a lot of fun because you can push it, you can go upstairs afterwards, you can push it, and you can see the little numbers go up, uh, and you're generating power. And uh, clearly that could be much more useful somewhere else than on the wall of our exhibition, and that's what we want to understand, is where, where that technology is coming from and, and perhaps where it can go to. So thank you very much for coming. Yes. everyone. So uh, it's my great pleasure to be here in the lovely London. Um, today, uh, I'm going to talk about some work we've done uh, in our lab about making the nano generators from uh, recyclable green material. Uh, so here is one photo that my research advisor took when he was in Singapore in 2016. So. Uh, so uh, on this floor, when you walk on it, it can generate electricity and power the LED display. Um, and so, uh, but this, uh, 
this cool floor is based on the uh, kind of uh, traditional technology called uh, piezoelectricity. Um, so it is useful, but it has some limitations, like the material itself uh, is uh, some inorganic material, so kind of expensive, even be toxic. Uh, so we uh, we developed uh, our new uh, developed a prototype in our lab based on new based on a new technology called tribal electricity. And so here is what uh, we've got. Uh, this is our prototype. Uh, we have a nano generator embedded in the uh, embedded in this uh, board, and we have some LED lights surrounding it. And uh, when you yeah, when you walk on it, it can generate electricity and power the LED lights. And uh, uh, this bottom line is our uh, manufacturing process. Uh, so first, we've got these uh, uh, nano generators. As I said, it is made from the cellulose, which is the main component of wood, of cotton. So it's very uh, environmentally friendly. And uh, we integrate this with uh, some uh, fibers recycled from cardboard and made it into this, uh, uh, this power board. And uh, uh, this is the cellulose. This is the cellulose we extracted from wood. It is nano. It is uh, at a nanometer scale, so it can. Uh, if we use it and we make um, we make it into a film, it can uh, preserve some nano features, which will be very useful uh, for our uh, tribal electric uh, tribal electric device design. And. Uh, mm, and as I said, uh, for uh, if we make the cellulose into such a film, uh, after uh, our use of this device, we can send this uh, device back to the nature just by um, fun just by the fungi degradation. So here is one photo uh, we've taken in our lab that uh, uh, we use the fungi to degrade the, to de uh, degrade our uh, device. It just took uh, like. Mm -hmm. I think after several months, it can uh, the, we can uh, observe a significant weight loss of this device, which means the uh, fungi has already started degrading it. And uh, here is a schematic show of this device. Uh, so the, the most important thing is uh, we have two uh, cellulose film. Uh, they, they were chemically treated in different ways. So they have uh, a different ability of, uh, uh, of, uh, of withdrawing or donating electrons. And then we, um, we deposit the electrode uh, at the back of this cellulose. And then we connected uh, these two electrodes through uh, external circuit. And then uh, in real application, we will uh, push or like lift or pu uh, press down this top cellulose. Then the uh, difference in surface potential uh, will drive the electrons flow, uh, flow in different ways and then create a current. And the, here is the photo. The first one is again the uh, the most important part, uh, the nano generator itself. And the, here is the some microscopy picture showing the nano features of the material itself. And uh, here is uh, the nano generator, how it looks like. And uh, uh, when you press it or release it, it can generate electricity. We never, like, uh, so each uh, press and release, we call it a cycle. So for each cycle, you get a electrical pulse. And uh, like here is a, uh, is a nano generator with only about one centimeter by, by one centimeter. Uh, the surface area is very small and uh, Whenever you do a press and a release cycle, it can generate such a pulse. Like the voltage output is about five volts, and uh, 
um, the current is at micro ampere um, uh, scale. And uh, uh, this bottom picture shows the durability of this device. Like uh, we did uh, 10 to the fifth cycles of uh, uh, press and release, it still uh, gives a very stable electrical output. And also, uh, here's more uh, study about like increasing the surface area, we can get more electrical output. Uh, this is uh, the frequency of applying the stress. So if you do it more frequently, it can generate more power. And uh, these three pictures are uh, showing like how it can charge the capacitors in a very short time. And uh, so uh, in the long run, uh, we see some benefits of our, uh, this prototype. And we are thinking of probably we can use it in smart packaging or like in the, uh, very, uh, in the areas where it has a very heavy footsteps, uh, foot traffic. Uh, actually, um, now uh, back in the States, we are, uh, our, camp our university is helping us to, um, to lay this uh, floor uh, on one, in one room, which is 10 feet, 10 feet by 10 feet. Yeah, I think, uh, and uh, uh, we are doing that. And also, um, at the side of the floor, we are uh, we are showing some display, so it can count like how many people pass by today and how much electricity, how much power we have generated. Um, so we are uh, quite happy with this. And, uh, and this is more for the electronic applications. I know here today we are more talking about buildings, uh, building materials. But uh, for electronics, it's uh, so this center one, we say if, if this is our nano generator and uh, all these surroundings are some uh, uh, cutting edge uh, electronic devices that uh, people are making them very thin and flexible. Uh, but uh, the problem for them is they need uh, to power all this very thing, like the thin film LEDs, uh, thin film circuits. They need a very, uh, they also need a flexible power source, but uh, also need a very high uh, power output. So currently, the battery couldn't uh, realize this, uh, couldn't meet their requirements. So we are thinking our nano generators could be a very good op uh, options for them in the future. Um, and uh, uh, that's what I've, oh, here, one thing is uh, also uh, we have some previous contacts uh, from the industry, like Nike, they, uh, they contacted us uh, saying if we can uh, integrate our technology with like their sports shoes. Uh, also, we've got some uh, contact from the uh, pallet uh, companies. Uh, so actually, um, for us, uh, I'm now thinking of um, me, and I and my advisor are thinking of starting out a company, uh, try to commercialize this uh, technology. So that's why I'm here today. I'm coming to get some feedback, some advice from, uh, from you guys. And uh, thank you. And uh, I appreciate any comments and advice. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting some comments. And so what we do now is if all the speakers could uh, move to the panel position, just over there. Um, and then we'll start moving some questions around, perhaps, if you've got some questions that are ready. Uh, I'll kick one off. Um, actually, Chugwak, can I begin with you? I, I just I just to sort of finish up my thoughts when I was seeing that. So how far is that from... Uh, you know, putting it in a concourse of a station or something. Clearly, there's loads of people walking down the down the, the road here and going into Tottenham Court Road tube station and all, all that, that the, all that foot traffic there. Is, it, is 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 this something which could quite quickly be st you could put it into concourses and and generate power that might light the station or whatever? But it's just a station. It's, it's the nearest station, in fact, is Tottenham Court Road tube station. But any any station, you know, the major major station concourses around the world. I mean, could you be using this 
as a, or an airport, you know, uh, could, could this quite quickly be brought in in this way? Yes, that we are thinking of uh, uh, what to do next. Uh, after we demonstrate that in our campus, I think uh, uh, we want to talk to people from the uh, industry hmm. to see if uh, there's any way uh, we can large scale manufacture this and uh, distribute. Yeah. I mean, as well, Habish talk about getting a company going and, and the sort of mm. challenges of, of, uh, sort of getting the investment and you have to outsource or you, cho you choose to outsource or you choose to, the various choices you make. And uh, have you been thinking about the kind of investment challenges to get your technology into a, into a robust product? What, what's, uh, what, what, what will it take in, in terms of, uh, have you got any sort of sense of the, this company you're possibly setting up um, to get this from being a very interesting but still experimental product to being a, uh, something for the marketplace. What, what might it take to do that? Chung this, this is for you, this question. That's my point. My <laughs> question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, just now from listening to his uh, talk, yeah, I realized. Uh, um, so for us, uh, now we are thinking of starting, up, uh, starting out the company. So we are seeking some uh, external funds like angels uh, or some other things. Uh, we are also writing proposals, and uh, uh, from the non-business section uh, session, we are uh, uh, we are applying for some government um, fundings, like the small business uh, initiator innovation research. It's called SBIR, uh, very popular in U in the states for the small business. Uh, so yeah, we are doing all this. No. Hey, Bish, have you got any uh, tips there? Um, um, I mean, I, I mean, certainly go after all the, the grants and all that are, are available. Um, I think the key, the key thing for for the building trade in particular, but also of anything, is is knowing what application your technology is actually delivering the main benefit for and focusing on that. It's very easy with a product like yours, which is quite an exciting development. Um, to say, well, we could go into medical packaging, or we right. could go into buildings, <laughs> or we could go into lots and lots of different areas. And if if you're if you're that broad at this stage in the game, you you'll you'll just dissipate your your energy, and you need right. to sort of focus down. I think mm. in, into what's the key drivers for it. Yes. Um, so so that would be my advice. I think in that sense. Thank you. Yeah, when 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 a client wants you a tree mode to sort of innovate what's I mean, basically you know, look, we like your product but not that much we want you to change it a bit to do this for us <laughs> um yeah how, how does that sort of feed into is that like oh don't want to do that or you know, how do you sort of make sense of it financially and and, and in terms of the, the, the sort of how is it viewed from the, the um, cycle of development firstly we look at the feasibility of the request yeah. um first and foremost it's um a composite cladding panel and it needs to fix the structure so you can't for example do away with the fixing zone because it needs to have an area where you can put fixings through into the steel um, the the recess uh, in the other direction we were asked if we could close that which we've done because that was just a modification of the tooling if um if they want to we'll say expand these things to um, other areas, it would need to go right back to the drawing board because of all the investigations on structural, thermal, uh, all all of those things that the system as it is would offer. But it since then, <coughs> for example, the f the flush version that Ron Dennis asks for, um, then we had the recessed version that ultimately went on the Mechano building. There's also now a hybrid version which has a bit of this and a bit of that and. And it, it's a case of if the modifications are feasible, then of course we'll entertain the idea. But Ernst, as, a, as, a, as an architect, let, let me um, do what I often like to do, which is to suggest that architects are the, the problem really here, because you know you, you keep trying to do a different building, you know, and so you're constantly yeah. instead of, uh, of 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 making a product and then you know rolling it out and finessing it. You keep starting from scratch and doing these new buildings. Yeah, these guys were saying, just why, is it, why aren't all your products, with, uh, all your buildings, with our product now? Yeah. So, oh, sorry, <laughs> I, mean, I, I do try. But, uh, I'm only half joking, which is that the, there is this problem about buildings that you're constantly sort of making another prototype, as it were. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, 
Uh, yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, 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 I think that's part of a desire to always innovate uh, as part of the industry that we're in, which maybe is a bit of a hindrance sometimes, but also it's necessary because in the UK, with, with all its history, with all its uh, constraints, planning constraints, um, it, it, you can't really do anything but have to innovate in terms of its building uh, location, form, arrangement, and ultimately the way that it's expressed in the outside. And in addition, you know, certain things like, uh, want, well, wanting to innovate is a good thing, really, to not only for the building expression, but for its thermal performance, for example, mm. and environmental qualities. You know, people, people are constantly striving to create buildings which are more sustainable. And technology is improving, so what you know, we need to keep pushing that forward. Lighter materials, uh, more more efficient ways of manufacturing, um, uh, the, the cradle to cradle approach, and so on. So, yeah. it wouldn't be. Are there certain yeah. priorities rising up there in what's important? Because uh, that point when you came to the crunch of like, well, we're a million <laughs> out in the budget, and this is the bit that we're going to push on. We're going to do something different here with the, yeah. uh, the overall envelope of the building. Um, yeah. I, 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 uh, but uh, uh, as you mentioned, cradle to cradle, a certain kind of changing values that we're having, and and does that su does that sort of feed into like, well, actually, this is this is what we care about changing because this is yeah. kind of well, you kind of the, in that situation, we were in a corner where the cost was was known, and the environmental credentials couldn't be lowered because we had to meet building regulations, and, and that's, that's uh, all the U values were were also locked down. So, so you have when 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 you're in a position like that, you have to innovate, and that's 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 thankfully with a product like Trima, we had which had a great aesthetic as well, a great system. That's what you're able to do. I think I think a lot of creators do flourish in that environment. I think you know, I think Picasso said that as well. If you don't have any constraints, then you don't you don't really uh, you yes. know, move on. So I think the more constraints, the better, and that, that was one illustration of it. Any questions in the room? I should ask for the questions. Has anybody got a question? No? Jamie's got a question? Yeah. Don't you do? Oh, you have a question. Yeah. I wanted to ask about the uh, effect of the maintenance or lack of maintenance on the solar, solar panels on the, in the glass. So does it affect the efficiency of the panels? Yeah, I mean, one of the sort of beauties of uh, solar power is, is actually the fact that it is as um, not a mechanical system and hence doesn't really require any maintenance of the actual panels themselves. Um, so as a piece of laminate glass, it works like a piece of laminate glass um, and will get dirty like a piece of laminate glass. Um, so um, from the maintenance point of view, it's a case of cleaning appropriately to the environment. Now the, the thin film um, has the advantage of, of, of um, not needing direct sunlight and therefore um, if there's dust and dirt on the glass itself it does it actually has much less of an impact than it does with a crystalline panel on the roof you have self-cleaning glass as well couldn't you you you, yeah. you can it's it's a lot of it's that's the on the outside of the yeah a lot of it's to do with the economics yes. or, or how accessible <coughs> the actual glass is itself um, the the petrol station you saw in that picture there so we've done um, a series of petrol stations for, 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 for both Sainsbury's and Morrison's um, it's basically a flat roof. I mean, it does have a slight pitch in order to the rain to sort of keep it clean to a degree, but um, they've never been cleaned, um, and we haven't seen any noticeable decline in the power output over the last three years um, on those. So um, I've, I've got my carport covered in the stuff, uh, <laughs> which is flat. Um, it's under trees, so it gets quite a lot of pollen on it. Um, it's not ideal, in my terms, as a, a solar uh, collector, but um, I clean that once a year with a hose. Yeah. Give you an idea. Yeah. The only other mechanical, the only other sort of thing is, is just um, the inverters and cells may need changing every decade or so. Um, but that is that sort of maintenance requirement. So <laughs> we we always get asked, you know, can you put in a maintenance cost into your budgets for this building? Can you provide a maintenance contract? Well. We can charge for somebody to go around and look at it, but that's basically all they're doing. <laughs> okay. I have a question over, over here. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions, actually. Um, the first one being to the first three presentations. Um, so I work with listed buildings. So is there any application to uh, both products? Um, to existing buildings and 
as you know, to uh, the, the architect um, involved. Has that been part of any discussions, or ha does that pose any limitations to what you can do with existing infrastructure? And the second question is for the last presentation. I wonder if you've come across PaveGen at all, and um, because they do, like you suggested, they they've got stuff in Heathrow Airport where they use the uh, kinetic movement to generate electricity and light, and there's, you know, so I'm just wondering how your product compares to that and how it could uh, improve the current situation. Great, shall I, shall I go first? Yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah so for the, the building, the home building, actually the, the railway viaduct is a listed structure, um, so that's that's one example. Um, it, I mean, working within heritage buildings, it's, 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 it's very, uh, specific to the project, isn't it? Um, some buildings are grade one and, and it's very difficult to make any adaptation at all. Some are grade two stars, some are grade two, which are a lot more adaptable and it very much depends on the nature of the building. Um, but I can definitely imagine a situation where you could you know, contrast new and old together in a way uh, that, 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 that works with a listed building of some sort. Yeah, I think so. It very much depends on on, on the building and the local authority and the conservation and officer view as well, um, but it's a great. It, what's it's a good quality material. It's a, it's sort of a very mechanised composite panel system, but it, it still has a fantastic aesthetic, which I think would would please um, those those bodies. Do you want to reply from me as well? Um, about the glass and whether you have used that in any mm. existing... Yeah, no, we, we, we get approached a lot on conservation buildings. I mean, the, the, the last slide I showed you of half the city yeah. is actually a conservation um, project, but um, we've got um, one at, um, uh, at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, which is a 1960s building. Um, so it's sort of slightly different in terms of its requirements, but equally there, it's a grade one listed, which means that the glass has wow. to have the same tint and color as the existing glass, um, as well as everything <laughs> looking identical. And we're, we're putting it in there. Um, and uh, we've done uh, a castle in Spain. Um, and the advantage of it is that you can hide it. It's not, you know, glass is sort of something that, you, that hides into the background. It's not something so, so visible. So it, it does lend itself to that. Um, at the domestic level, we sell quite a lot of greenhouses and garden structures um, because they don't require changes to the planning on the actual buildings themselves. <laughs> but you can tint the glass lots of different ways, can you? And it still has, it has effect. Sorry, tint it. You, tint, you, can, you can color the glass different we, we ways. Are, so we, we can color the glass to a degree. Um, what we do is we use a color laminate in between the, hmm. the, the layers, um, and that's what gives it a color tint. We also use, um, interestingly, from what you've been talking about on the metal side, we use a, a nano coating from a it's actually a Swiss um, development, but it's, it's a nano coating which refracts the light at different angles to allow you to get different colors off the glass without actually affecting the power generation of the, of the PV. So lots of interesting sort of developments. That yeah. Everything's possible, it's just what it costs at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so shall we move to the second, the second question you came up with? Um, do you want to hear it again, or are you okay, Choma? I think you are talking about the PowerGen. You're saying the company's name is called PowerGen? The one I've come across is PaveGen. Oh, PaveGen. Pave yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I've seen that news somewhere. Um, so based on our market research, I think currently all the technology, uh, the commercialized ones, they're based on piezoelectricity or probably the magnetic induction. They do have their advantages and uh, they're very mature one. Um, uh, but for us, I think we are very competitive in costs and environmentally friendly. Thank you. What's the environmental downside to these competitors then? Uh, I don't know the Pavedron he was saying. I'm not sure if it's piezo. If it's piezo, probably have some uh, problems with uh, tox toxicity. Hmm. Um, if it's the magnetic induction, I think it's more about the, the st structure itself. It's a little complicated and uh, it's probably complicated, cost yeah. costly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. so if using ours, I think it's just very simple to generate electricity. Right. Yep. Any other questions? Yep, thanks. Uh, yes. 
Uh, I'd just like to know um, how, when you were developing a new product for the, the cladding, uh, how you build the client for the time that was spent doing this. Because my experience is you could actually devote half of the time that you spend on designing a project to bringing forward new ideas and so on. And there's a sort of 70% chance the client will take them on board. But it loses all of your profit margin in running the architectural job. Yeah. Um, I wondered how it was done in this case. Did you actually have an additional fee for dealing with this situation? Um, I, I guess, yes, in, in the... the the, the, you, as, as an architect, you, the project, the, when, you, when you're putting your fee together in the first place, is based on a program. Uh, and that program extended, uh, and that was not due to our doing. So as part of that innovation process that we had to overcome uh, cost issues in this case and, and, and others, that, that it was re re remunerated, yes. But I guess the overall it, it, it point was that your, yeah. the extra costs of coming up with a solution yeah. was, still came in, obviously, uh, reducing yeah. the overall cost. It, it, it is always a challenge. I mean, you have to allow for some, some, something in, in the fee to, to, to allow for that process to happen that, that will happen to, 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 to absorb the cost of these things. And, and also, as a, as, as, as a practice, if you're in Clegg Bradley, for example, there's a continuous uh, investment in research as a side stream, you know, as, as a practice, profits are reinvested. So there's ways to stream in to that as well, uh, into the into the projects, for example. So there's there's research going on within the practice that can, in, in different ways, not in different ways, in different means that that, that you can draw onto, which are also an interesting way right. of going but circumventing that. But you have to become quite quite sure that only ten percent of your projects are innovative, so the other ninety percent can generate the profit that enable you to do that. Potentially, yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, from the sort of manufacturer's side, it's equally the same issue. Um, is it's very easy to spend a lot of your time and energies developing and innovating, um, and it, you know, is what ultimately can kill you. Um, I mean, one of the issues we have, for example, is certification. Um, so, you know, we've got to sell a certified product, um, and if we go down the route of being too innovative. Um, we've then got to recertify and mm. all their associated costs and difficulties related to that. So there, there is a sort of happy compromise, I think it's probably fair to say, on, on, on innovation. But it is, you know, you can do anything as long as you pay for it. It's, it's as simple as that at the end. But you can get R&D credit. You can claim R&D credit. Sorry, could you speak in the microphone? It just uh, helps us. Yeah. Um, well, you can claim R&D credit from the tax on your tax return on on research. So that's another thing mm. that I don't think a lot of company are aware of or or pursuing. You know, and that's only allowed on the profit that the company makes, that's providing right. you make a profit. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to make the profit. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. Um, yes, yeah, so a question for Hamish. Um, Stephen Edwards from Catalyst Housing. Um, I just wondered on, in terms of applying the integrated PV to residential, whether there's a kind of barrier to the aesthetic. Um, I think, you know, people are more tolerant in, say, a commercial or public space building, but, you know, when it's your own home, what, what do you feel the barriers are and, and, and are you sort of managing to overcome that in any residential applications? Um, yes, I mean... Uh we don't do a lot of residential, um, uh, and the reason oh, it's a joke, but for residential windows, um, the big issue there really is that there's just not enough area of window to make it worthwhile. So it's not economic um, to to replace your windows with our glass currently. Um, on large glazed areas, it becomes more sensible. So we do quite a lot on the sort of conservatory summer house area where you've got large areas of glass. Then it starts to make sense. And we do quite a lot of outbuilding um, side of things. We also do complete roof systems, but um, then it is a different aesthetic. It's not a it's not a roof tile or a slate or whatever else you might be replacing. It's it's quite um, dramatic. It looks you know it looks attractive, but it's not um, it's not a, you know, a, a subtle um, replacement in those circumstances. 
I don't know if that answers your question, did it? I mean. um, well, the, I mean, one particular example, we... we Sorry, I, I think if you can speak to the um, microphone. So. We uh, took, did a building some years back, um, which was a tower block, so I don't know, it's about 12, 15 storeys high, um, and we used Brie Soleil on that, and I just yeah. wonder whether, you know, you know, say in a residential block where you might have quite a bit more... Oh, sorry, yes, no, I mean, we, we do, we're doing a residential block at Canary Wharf at the moment, well, um, <coughs> tendering for it. Um, that is um, spandrel panel, so the opaque elements. Um, it has some of the glazing area, not all the glazing area. Um, it's where you've sort of got um, your kitchen or toilet type of uh, glass requirements. And we're also uh, looking at doing the balconies, so they're glass balconies. Um, um, so yes, it's, it's applicable to where you would normally put a tinted glass, um, not necessarily applicable currently to your vision glass area. Um, but yes, you can be used in, in residential as much as commercial generally. Okay, we got any other questions? Uh, one in front. Uh, it's just for the uh, nano generator. I just wanted to find out the your product when the pressure if the pressure is static does it continue to produce power and does it produce more or it just has to you have to press and release all the time yes so uh, it produce uh, power every time you press it so when it's static no if the pressure is continuous so if somebody is standing on it does it continue to produce power um no, no. <laughs> just one spark, that's all. Right. So we are thinking of the applications in the high foot traffic area might be the best. Yeah. How much pressure do you need? So it's, um, it's, it's not really about pressure. It's actually about the, so for the nano generator, we have two films. It's about the displacement between these two films has to be changed. So even if it's a baby like walking on it, it can generate electricity. Yeah. Have a go on the one upstairs and you can see just, just touch it and, and yeah, generate some power. Slight. It's very simple. The electricity production depends on the pressure. Uh, depends on what? On the pressure. Best if you speak in the microphone because then we can all no, sorry. I mean if um, the question is whether the, gen the energy gener generation is actually related directly to the amount of pressure. So if I step on it, or if a kid steps on, on the panel, does it c generate the same amount of energy? Or it's, is there a correlation between the, the pressure and the energy generated? So I think there is a correlation, but it doesn't have to be linear. Yeah. And yeah. Do you think it would be feasible to power a keyboard? So imagine hundreds of office workers press key, keys on the keyboard and generate electricity. Oh, keyboards? Yes, actually, um, we were thinking of that. <laughs> yes, because it just push all the time. You can get, uh, actually, it can, it, you don't have to use it for energy generation. You can actually use it as sensor on keyboards like if you touch this key like the s key then it can generate electricity this electricity can be a signal for you letting you know oh you touched the, the s key yeah but is it feasible to think for example the amount of power that you could generate from touching the keyboard would actually power the what you're wanting from the device as it were so oh can you say that again Sorry. the the amount of power that you can generate by touching the keyboard would it be enough to kind of run the device maybe that you're, you're working with. So um, let's say when I'm tapping my phone, a little bit of power that goes into tapping my phone, mm. could that no. actually power the phone? I no. think for phone, you need a much more energy. Uh, uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it consumes a lot of energy. <laughs> what if my phone was made from, from the polysolar glass as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've still we got the energy problem there. <laughs> we can work together like to this. power your phone. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, anything, uh, anything else? Any questions? Any more? Okay. 
Well, I think that last line there, we can work together, I think that summarizes what innovation is all about. In fact, it brings me to my little quote that I, I was looking at all the quotes, all the many quotes that people say about innovation and, and development things, and, and boy, do they get very cheesy and very repetitive and then also very contradictory. But if I was going to pull one out of it that says, says something which seems to be a, a good truth to take, uh, and this is the Jonathan Ive quote, the, uh, the head of uh, design at Apple, uh, which is, innovation is a team game. So there we go. So team game. Um, now, we were going to have a bit of teamwork tonight. We were actually offered a two-for-one drink deal. And then our barman and bar staff, they had a bit of a problem uh, in terms of being able to function tonight. There's some staffing issues. And so we didn't have it open. Uh, so very sorry about that. But if you ever come again and you want a two-for-one deal, uh, <laughs> go up to the bar and say, I demand my two-for-one deal on a drink because they will fulfill. Just say to Manu, you promised it to me at the baristas, and he will give it to you. But anyway, they are, I think some people are going to go over the road for a drink, and it's, it's not a two-for-one deal there, to my knowledge, uh, but uh, I know that uh, some people are going to go, maybe the speakers, uh, and you're very welcome to join us. Otherwise, have a look at upstairs. Um, perhaps you could go and, and show your device working on the wall. That'd be kind of good, so you can just see how much power is generated. And thank you all for coming, and thank you very much to Trimo, who not only have taken part in tonight, but actually have supported this whole series of talks that have been for free with the Super Materials exhibition. So a big thanks for that. So thank you.